Auntie Bert, as I call you. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted. Uh, we've tried to do this a few times. And just for a wee bit of context for people who are watching or listening, I was thinking about this on the way and on the bus today. I was like, when's the first time I met Auntie Bert? And I was like, I think I was 16 years old. You were. And it was through a very close mate of mine, Nathan Steenson. Mm -hmm. And we were just 16, angsty, spotty, full of big, big, big questions. And we just didn't know, what are we going to do with our lives? And we don't know about the future. And what about purpose and meaning? And we, we came to you. Mm -hmm. And you have played a really beautiful role in my life and the life of so many people where uh, somewhere between a, a mentor, a sage, a fairy godmother, a spiritual guide, Help us a, all. A, a, an auntie, <laughs> auntie Bert, <laughs> auntie Bert, and you're you're auntie Bert to many. So yep. I'm delighted to have the chance to uh, chat to you very artificially here with microphones and cameras and all that sort of stuff. But just to document what I think is an incredible life that you've lived and a, a beautiful story that I think's worth sharing. So if we start off way way back, where were you born and bred, and what are some of the first things that you can remember? Right, I was born in Belfast. Uh, I'm about to give my chair. Hold on a minute. Here, I'll <laughs> tell you what, I'm not going to stop you. <laughs> right, okay. I was born in 1947. Yo. Uh, so I'm 75, coming up 78. Uh, in October of this year, I'll be seven, 76, sorry. Um, and I was the second child down uh, in the family. My mother, they got, mommy and daddy got married in 1945. And very quickly got pregnant. And uh, then she got pregnant again very quickly. So the second child, uh, the, she didn't know how she was going to uh, feed it and whatever, because you're, you're just after the war. Mm. My father was a butcher. They lived away out near Glen Gormley. And my mother was uh, quite ill with the second child. And uh, she must have been about two months pregnant when somebody said to her, you know, Molly, the the fact that you're, you've... Uh, not feeling very well. They didn't run to the Royal for a scan. Yeah. So you're not feeling very well. Uh, you might be having a malformed child. And that went for my mother's head. Right. And she nearly had a nervous breakdown. But uh, my uh, great uncle owned a, a place called Throne Mount at, out the Antrim Road. And the Belfast uh, Bible College rented it. And my mother and father lived in the cottage of that. So she walked in those days the, up the Antrim Road. The uh, bus only went to uh, the castle. And there's still a terminus at the castle for the trolley buses and whatever. So she walked it to the trolley buses. But her head was swimming with this idea. She was going into Belfast to see her mother in the Ulster Hall. My grandmother was the, the head cleaner in the Ulster Hall. Oh, well. So she was going into Belfast to see her mother and talk about this second pregnancy and whatever. Why did but, they jump straight to malformed child? That's a bit but, of, but but they didn't go in, in 1947. Um, there wasn't scans. You didn't have scans yeah. or whatever. So with her being so sick, they just said, "Oh, that must they be just one of these." Oh, you know, you could be having. Crazy. But, but just that line mm. went for her head, and so she ended up not even getting on the trolley bus, going round to Belfast, going to see her mother, and as she goes to the Ulster Hall, there's this absolutely super um, singing going on, and my mother was in choirs, and uh, all my family sing, all the family, and wow. I sing too. And it, it ended up, she went into the Ulster Hall and a preacher was preaching on the stage and there was a big choral choir. <clears throat> and the preacher was W.P. Nicholson. Oh, my goodness. And uh, at the end, he asked people to come to know Jesus. And she walked the aisle with a tansad, as they called it in those days. And with he, a what? A tansad. A, tan, a tansad was called the pram. A wee push. A wee push oh, okay, a wee, wee pram. Push. It's called a tansad. <laughs> we don't call them that any longer. So she walked in. Uh, he led her to the Lord and she began to cry very heavily. And he said to her, but, you know, do you, have you not got a peace that you've given your heart to the Lord? And my mother said, but you don't understand. I'm, I've got a baby in the pram here and I have a baby in my womb and I'm really uh, quite sick with it. And somebody has said to me it could be a malformed child. That man prayed over the baby in my mother's womb. And at the end of that, my mother handed the baby over to the Lord, saying to the Lord, if you would just bring this baby into the earth, uh, birth it, have it be normal. I'm handing it over to you for service. Wow. Okay. 
So I'm the baby that uh, my mother gave to the Lord. Now, I didn't know that until I was about 36. So I came up through... Uh, my mother really should have been a teacher, but way back those in those days, people started to work at 14. And she was a weaver in um, Yurt's mill up the Shankill Road. So anyway, she goes on and she has more babies and whatever. But Mommy, because she had given her life to the Lord in 1947, she made sure that when she went to church, she brought her children to church. Mm. And so for me and the rest of the family, we were brought up in Clifton Street United Presbyterian Church at Carlisle Circus. And it's called Clifton Street United Presbyterian Church because Clifton Street Presbyterian was bombed during the war. Right. And the Reformed Presbyterians, the Covenanters across the road, brought the congregation across. And that w- that's why the history of that is Clifton Street United Presbyterian that's Church. That's lovely. So... We ended up, I was in the uh, Sunday school and always uh, singing. My, mom, my mother always sang. Mm-hmm. But I went to a Baptist church school on the Antrim Road. It was called Antrim Road uh, Primary School. And it was in the a very small wee school in the church halls of Antrim Road Baptist. And my first P1 teacher was a lady called Miss Gregg who also was musical. Oh, there you go. And so as she uh, taught her children, whatever, she could hear that I could sing Mm -hmm. in tune. And uh, so she used to stand me on a wee desk and say, Roberta, you sing such and such. And Isabel's still alive today. She's 94. (laughs) And I've gone to see her. She lives in Ballygown now. Uh, but I, br- I blame her. I, <laughs> I blame her for my singing and my extrovertness and, you know, everybody has to look at me uh, idea and whatever. So uh, that's how I started to sing, really, you know, wow. standing on a wee desk and on the road. And in church, I got to sing the solos and whatever. Mm-hmm. So when I came up through, um, I went to the girls' model in North Belfast. I did qualify, but in those days, the... Um, just after the war, there were so many children after the war babies. And so the secondary schools had a grammar part. Okay. And I didn't get into, I, my first choice was Belfast High, didn't get into it. But I went to the girls' model. And uh, that was a great school. And then I ended up going down to Belfast Royal Academy when I got my junior. But my parents had a cottage in Island McGee. And <laughs> I love Island McGee, as you know. Uh, they had a wee cottage on top of uh, Port Muck Hill called Hilltops and the cottage was called the Wren's Nest. Two roomed cottage, no running water, uh, no electricity. And my mother was thrown down there with, at the, in those days, three kids uh, to get on with it. Daddy stayed in Belfast. And those years, those months with mommy were just absolutely super. Mm. She should have really been a teacher. but uh, So she had the, the gifting of um, bringing children on, always encouraging, you can mm. do better, you can do. Wow. And so my mother was the encourager in the family. My father wasn't. So she brought us up just believing that if you put your mind to it, yeah. you can do it. It's really interesting because you do. You have a lovely way about you with kids. And I've always kind of wondered where that comes from. But that must be a wee bit of an impartation. I, I'm very like mommy. Mom. Yeah. I'm very like my mom. Even with, with my wee girl, it's like you're, uh-huh. you have that encourage, encouragement kind of spirit to you. Uh-huh. you know? Well, I think having a, a mother who was positive, I'm a very positive person. So yeah. it's just rubbed off. And my grandmother was the exact same. Always telling you that you were yeah. you're lovely. Those clothes are nice on. Do you like my clothes today? I love them. Very, my, very nice, my, dressed up, colourful for the, of many colors. the audience. So, <laughs> yes. So why, those years in the cottage, you know, you describe them as brilliant years. Like, why were they so brilliant? Like, give us a wee bit of colour or uh, story the, or they, scene. They were or, so brilliant because we only had mommy. Uh, mm. My mother... Uh, played like a child with us and she yeah. walked us across fields and over styles and told stories and got down at a wee stream, we got the spricks and the tadpoles and whatever. If my father had been around, we wouldn't have been doing that because mm-hmm. my father was um, very, um, I, I can't say in love with my mother. He, 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 was, very, he was a very attention-seeking person. Mm-hmm. We, everything had to focus on him. Mm-hmm. So when he was in the house we didn't really get a look in. Right. In fact, we were put to bed at half six at night and it was we always believed we were there uh, put to bed simply because 
your brain got arrested for going to school the next day. Yeah. But looking back, when you get older, you begin to realise, oh, hold on a wee minute here, mm-hmm. that my daddy doesn't really want his children with Molly. Yeah. Uh, Molly was my mother. So it was for the two months mm-hmm. we just had mummy on our own you and it was just absolutely brilliant, really. I mean, the loo, maybe I shouldn't be telling this, but the loo, <laughs> was, a, the loo was a dry bog, it was just a bucket. And every now and again you had to empty it, you know. And by the time we were only children, by the time you, you emptied the bucket, it was halfway down your water boots and your legs <laughs> and, and whatever. But great fun, really great fun. And on the back of me going to Port Muck, I met a girl called Maureen. Mm. And she, her parents had a cottage on the Browns Bay Road and she had to walk. Her father had died. Elsie, the mother, had to go to work again. And there were three three girls, Maureen, Rosemary and Valerie, two years in between them. Wow. Maureen became the sort of mother of the, of the three. Okay. And as she walked across the field, picked me up on, in the wren's nest at the top of Portmuck Hill and then dropped down the hill to Portmuck. Now, I don't know anybody that's listening knows Portmuck. Port Muck is a wee pier at the in Island McGee, and uh, in those days, hardly anybody had cars. You see, so all the wee cottages around had at least two and three children in each cottage, mm. and overall, there must have been about sixty wow. children. It's like a caravan park. Yeah, yeah, only yeah, we yeah. were in cottages, and all the cottages, no running water, but we were all the same. But and and no money. I mean, most of us, you might have been fortunate if you got a thruppany bit from your granny. And <laughs> the shops in those, there's no shops either. You know, you might have been fortunate if you got, I mean, I'm going back to the days when crisps had just started. Oh, and really? a wee blue bag wow. in the crisp. Yeah, and you had, you know, plain crisps. And you found this wee blue bag in the bottom and you sh- shook the salt over, you know. Class. It's a way back. We were talking the 50s. What are you eating? Like, you know, what are you guys eating in the cottage? What are we eating? Yeah. Well, the fishermen used to go out to, to fish. The, the, the daddy, a lot of the daddies had wee boats and went out to over to the maidens and caught mackerel and whatever. Oh, really? And I had to be back in up the, the hill for nine o'clock at night. But I waited for the boats. Only excuse. There was fellas. No, we had fellas, <laughs> no. Uh, only an excuse that, to uh, wait for the boats coming in with the mackerel. And then they would they would give you mackerel. Wow. And then I would come up the hill and go in the front door of the ranch nest going, Mommy, I'm sorry, I'm late, I'm sorry, I'm late. But the boat was late, the boat was late. <laughs> and, uh, she would put the pan on at that time of night and, and do the, the fish with uh, uh, porridge oats. And sit and eat. But you see, there was no father there to control or, or yeah. whatever, or say, yeah. Molly, get to bed, or, yeah, yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just a very happy time. Class. But Maureen used to come across and pick me up and then drop down. And we, we swam. Uh, I mean, that's what we did all day. And that's where we washed. Mm-hmm. You know, my mother would say to us, make sure you go into the sea. Because there was no... There's yeah, no, no shower. You see, that's really cool. Now, now everyone's going <laughs> well, everybody's cold, cold water, water swimming, yes, and that's, very true. <laughs> that's just that's your very true. We, we were the beginnings of that. <laughs> so uh, one day, I played a clarinet when when I qualified. My mother bought me a clarinet, and I played in the Belfast Youth Orchestra uh, way back then. And my brother, for him passing quality, I had a brother ahead of me, a year and a half ahead of me. He got a guitar, mm. okay. So we were talking at the end of the 50s and you've got Elvis and you had Tommy Steele and you had, I mean, maybe people listening to this haven't a clue what I'm talking about. So the, the very beginnings of the rock and roll and whatever, and my brother played, you know, three chord tricks and whatever, and he taught me a few chords. So we came down to Portmuck one day and this girl, Maureen, that uh, she had a guitar. Guitar. And so she was playing her guitar with her two sisters, singing a song called Breaking in a Brand New Broken Heart, Connie Francis. And I sat down beside her and I, I've always been able to harmonise. Mm-hmm. So I harmonised with her and we find Mooring and myself found that we could sing very well together. And that was great. We had a great summer. We sang. We sang all the 60s and all these new songs. And I also had um, a fella that lived close to the cottage called Doodle. And Doodle was a, a sailor, a merchant navy, and he brought back records that we ah, didn't get here in Northern Ireland. And we all went to Doodle's house, uh, all cottages, and we listened to, in those days, Jim Reeves. And Jim Reeves' ones were easy to play, three chord tricks, nice wee harmonies, Anna Marie, you know. Um, so when we came back to Belfast, we found out that we nearly all the gang 
that was at Portmuck lived along the Antrim Road. They they went to Belfast High, uh, Royal Academy, Model. um, So the gang that was at Portmuck stayed together and I used to get a bus up the Antrim Road and we went to a a, a gang house called Boyd Queries. And uh, Mrs Query loved the kids in because uh, she didn't want us all out in the streets and doing naughty things and whatever. So she was quite happy with this room, a room probably about 12 by 12. Mm -hmm. And they had a a huge uh, portrait, huge um, big mirror, and they took the, 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 the middle bit out. And it just had wall behind it. And we all signed. Everybody that came into that room <laughs> signed. And I'm sure it's still there. They'd probably take the wallpaper yeah, off yeah, the walls yeah. in um, Waterloo Gardens, it was. Um, so we, we had great nights. and We played our records. And we were really in, into that beginning of the end of the 50s, end of the 60s. So Mooring and myself found that we could sing very well together. Um, I learnt more chords and whatever. My mother was on the committee of Clifton Street United Presbyterian Church and she asked me to sing. And I said, can I bring my friend? <laughs> and so my friend came with me. Maureen was so nervous, she had to sit on a chair. I've always had confidence. I don't know. That's because you were standing up on tables or maybe <laughs> four or five four. years old. <laughs> yeah, I've always had... Um, I don't, I don't know. I've just always been yeah, yeah. this. And she sat and we sang five songs got clapped and everything and we thought we were brilliant <laughs> and at the end this guy came across and said would we sing there was a guy called Tommy Robb who was a motorbike guy okay. and he had won some cup I don't know anything about motorbikes but he had won a, some type of race or whatever and they were having a function in um, Barnett's house up the Malone Road and would we come and sing? And we said, well, we don't have any transport. I was 14. Uh, we don't have any transport. Oh, we'll send a car. <laughs> well, this huge, big black thing came. You know, the the, the um, indicators were the, the flappy things. Oh, the wee the flags side, at the, the side. Yeah, at the side. And, whatever, and, and the running boards and whatever. This big black car came, collected Maureen. She lived in Taunton Avenue. I lived Bennett Drive up uh, beside the waterworks. And the car took us over and we sang our five songs and we went very well. We actually had a very close harmony like the Everly Brothers. Okay. Right? I am, unfortunately, we have no recordings of ourselves, but but we we did sound really tight. I was the bottom harmony. I was the bottom voice. She was the top voice. And of the harmonies, we could switch in wow. between. If If the natural harmony was above, she took it. If the natural harmony was, you know, we, mm-hmm. we could switch and it, it it was sometimes complicated even to, you know, get songs that would go that route. So anyway, guy came over to us and he said, what's your fee? And we were going, fee? We well, haven't got a fee. And he said, oh, you'll have to have some money. And we got paid four guineas, which was four pounds, four shillings in wow. the old money for people who are my age and underst- <laughs> understand what we thought we were like just. And it just snowballed from there. Um People asked us to go and do and, and whatever. And we did a lot of church work because I was brought up in church. Maureen was brought up in Rosemary Presbyterian Church. And so we did a lot. In those days, the Presbyterian Church had things like, they were called daffodil teas. They were okay. concerts. Now, maybe they were even in Christmas time, but they were still called daffodil teas. And daffodils only come out in the spring. So we did all these concerts. And uh, a song that made us very popular was a song called We Willies Lost As Marley. I don't know if you know it or not. It's an old Belfast thing. So, uh, and the Seekers had started. The old Seekers, do you remember? I don't even know what Seekers is. Oh, you fucking sick. What do you like? Um, Educate me. The Seekers came across from Australia in 1963, 64, I think. And they were like students. They weren't doing very much, but they came, they were on a cruise boat and they came across only for probably about six or eight weeks and they did so well here they'd met a guy called Tom Springfield have you heard of Dusty Springfield? I have heard of Dusty Dusty Springfield was part of the Springfields and her brother was Tom Springfield. Tom Springfield wrote a lot of the songs that we know today and uh, they gave the Seekers a song and they just blossomed but the Seekers the Seekers um, 
sang light-hearted gospel songs like this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Yeah. They sang all those uh, sort of Negro type things. Yeah. And so we sang those as well. We, we copied and sang those things. And it literally just snowballed until one day we did an audition for, now I was still at school. Um, I must have been about, uh, probably about 17. Uh, went to Belfast, right, I was doing my A-levels. And uh, we did an audition down facing St. Anne's Cathedral in a place called the Delta. And the audition was for going to sing on the American basis. That's uh, so because bizarre. I know. I know. And my ma let me go. <laughs> you know. Um, the, the Americans in those days, the Vietnam War was on. And so the, the, the boys that were enlisted, the enlisted men, they were called, they were 18 to 20 years of age. Yeah. Okay. Now, I think we were chosen. We, we we got the audition, but I think we were really chosen for the fact that we were the age group yeah. of the boys who gotcha. had to go to the army. I mean, Elvis even had to go to the army. That's right. So they were all over in places like Turkey, Greece, um, Spain, Italy. Mm-hmm. And uh, so instead of going pea picking as students did in those days across to canning factories. We went to sing on the American basis. Wow. And uh we had we had we did um Turkey and Greece, Crete and whatever. And was, so uh, like the audition, what is it? Uh, was it a build in the Delta? It's just I, I don't know if it's there now. Yeah. So like it, it who who's paying for that? Like why is there people recruiting for a Entertainment for well, American bases in Belfast. I would, say, I would Belfast. say some people made a lot of money out of Maureen and Roberta because we, <laughs> we didn't get paid very much. Were we just four, thought four we were gigs still. <laughs> <laughs> I would say somebody was tapping off the back of us. I don't know. Uh, we, we we made some money. It's a strange it. concept to me that like there would be recruiters in Belfast trying to get entertainment talent for bases around the world for the Americans. It's not even like it's the British or the Irish army. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's yeah. bizarre. Well, I don't know. Well, there it that's, is. That's a mystery. If anyone that, knows, that, that's, write us in. <laughs> that, that's what happened. Yeah. So we went. So you you go did. from the big big adventure to Island McGee to just like flying all around the world, or well, we didn't fly all around the world. <laughs> we did a lot of dates here. We were we were the we were the act at the very beginning of places like the talk of the town. It's not there any longer. They're bombed and and, um, but in nineteen sixty three, I would say. Females who went into the pubs were nearly not nice girlies, if you yeah. know what I mean. It wasn't the pub was not a place for for females to go. By the time it got to about probably nineteen sixty four sixty five, Belfast had started their pubs had started to grow bigger and become cabaret clubs. Okay. And so all over Belfast, you had these pubs uh, becoming bigger and getting someone like Maureen and Robert in. They always had a group, mm-hmm. but we were the cabaret. We did we did the band break because we both could play guitars. Boys went off to have a beer, whatever, and we sang. Uh, so, I mean, and we didn't just sing once a week. We <laughs> were out every night in the week. Class. Maureen and myself were out every night in the week. And um, when... I also went to Strandmillis College to be a school teacher. Uh, <laughs> on, the well. side. No, on the side. On the side. I know. Uh, <laughs> side hustles. It, the, the life, it's just how I got <laughs> all my life into 24 hours a day. I do <laughs> not know. But uh, Maureen was two years ahead of me and she was at Strand. So we both went to Strand at a time. And all those summers that we were off, we were away singing. We did the clubs in England. What do you see? 1966, we did um, the clubs in England and Germany and uh, whatever. 65, we did a summer season in Bundoran with Bridie Gallagher and whatever. We were we were right. In fact, I would have gone full time. Mm-hmm. Only Maureen had gone to Strand before me right. and she, she was settled. Yeah. She also had a boyfriend called Gordon, whom she married and still married to him. I was the raker. <laughs> would you know that I was the raker? I was, I was never settled at all. Uh, I had loads of boyfriends, but... You know, singing was my life. Yeah. And some of these boys wanted me to give it up for them and all this jazz and absolutely no way. I was the singer. Yeah. Gordon fortunately allowed Maureen to sing. Mm. He was quite happy with her, right? Because he knew where she was. Mm -hmm. In fact, he came with us and drove us to many places. So it worked for her. But for me, it just didn't seem to work at Mm -hmm. all. And then what happened in my life, uh, I was going with this guy Doodle. I was, it was 1970. Last so same doodle from, same doodle yeah, from the McGee. fields. Well, we went and didn't and went and didn't and, and, and whatever. And uh, he uh, was, I was uh, just about to do my exams in the 
springtime of 1970. And I heard in the news that he was killed on a motorbike accident coming down the low road in Isle McGee. Mm. And that was, quite, that was quite a dunt in my life. Mm. Uh, he was... I don't know whether I would, ma- I would have married him, mm-hmm. but he 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 was a lovely guy and a, a lovely singer. And I think I always had in my head that maybe we could sing together yeah. when Maureen got married and had her babies yeah. doodling with self. Cause who knows? Yeah. I don't know. I was 22, I think, at that stage. So I was the first dunt. Now, I've always been a drinker. I was always a drinker in mm-hmm. those days. Maureen never drank. Mm-hmm. I always had... My first drink was uh, a vodka at 16, Always the party girl, mm-hmm. the guitar going, whatever. Always the fun girl, whatever. Maureen was more serious. And you, you hear people like talk about their first drink. Was it a case for you where it's like, you know, you had your first drink and all the lights switched on in your head and you had the warm blanket around you? <laughs> you know, was it, as su- was it as sudden as that or was it gradual or? For me, drinking? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I, it was just everybody drank. I mean, most people drank in mm-hmm. those days, uh, really. And we all drove cars yeah. I mean, by the time we got up to driving our cars yeah. the, the, the the police weren't there with the breathalysers mm-hmm. or anything so there was a lot of drinking going on uh, at all I was just a giddy person I was just a, a person who was having fun if somebody had you know said to me you're not having fun yeah. per- forget it yeah. really uh, I don't know I was just having fun so you've been drinking since 16 and then 22 you have your first dunt as you say doodle gets killed that I think was a big dunt and you know I was a party girl um, whatever and I think I was beginning to realise that um, I drank very heavily Mm -hmm. I was out every night Mm -hmm. every night taking a drink but by the time I got to that age I was starting to have terrible hangovers and when you have hangovers, the, the the head starts to say, you know, if you had another... My my poison was Vat 19. Vat 19, it was like a lemonade to me. Uh, if you just have a wee, uh, you know, that'll set your stomach, mm. you know. So, and then there's there's uh, verses that say, you know, have a wee wine for your stomach's sake. <laughs> you know? So you might have had a wee wine for your stomach's sake and whatever, but I, it never, ever occurred to me that I would end up with a drink problem mm-hmm. at all. So came up through, uh, we're now into the dunt, and then uh, Maureen got married, mm-hmm. and that was a big, that was like mm. half of me away, yeah. really. I just about coped with it because she was beginning not to want to go out to sing, mm. and I thought to myself, well, I don't want to split. We're still very good friends. Mm-hmm. We're still, she she has a cottage at Portmuck, Love right it. in Portmuck. Um, I didn't want to split the friendship or or whatever. So I waited until she got pregnant. And when she got pregnant, I said, look, I think it's time mm-hmm. I went on my own. Eel. So by 1972, I think it was, we had split. We'd done 10 years together. But I mean 10 years together. We were like that mm-hmm. all the time. Dear help, Gordon. We were like that all the time. And then we split and I went solo. And that was uh, when danger really started because going solo on uh, was very lonely. Mm-hmm. You arrive at pubs, um, what time am I on at, whatever, you stand at the bar. Now, I never drank, believe it or believe it or not, I never drank before I went on stage mm-hmm. because I always went on sober. But when I came off, okay, you Bert, you know, and all the, you know. And, That's the George Bass thing, let me buy you a pint. Then, and we go back to ple- people's houses. Yeah. Have you got your guitar, Bert, whatever? You're talking 1971, 72, 73. You'd all the Sabines, you'd all the wee... I have no idea even what that is. Roscoe, okay. do you know what a Sabine is? No idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, no idea. Had, uh, the troubles had started, you say, in 69, and um, the pubs... Uh, People didn't really want to go to pubs, mm-hmm. so in different areas, these we illegal uh, bars started to. Right. Uh, so all the shabinas, what a I call garage, it, a wee, wee a wee, everywhere, yeah. all over the place. And uh, I used to sing in the Welders Club over by East Belfast. Ah, yes, it's still there. Yeah. Oh, it's still there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, used to sing in the Welders, and the the guy who was the um, compere. 
Uh, he was a drinker. What are you doing now, Bert? I said, I'm not doing anything. By this stage, I'd bought a wee house in Jordanstown. Uh, so I was living away from home. No parental control. Mm-hmm. Nobody shouting at you. What time is this to come in at? Or yeah. Whatever. So, no no uh, sensible Maureen on your side. <laughs> no, no, no guide here at all. So I ended up going back to these, you know, knock three times on the door. Who hey, is it? Oh, it's such and such. Uh, have you got Roberta with Yeah. you got a guitar with it? Yeah. So I'd, I'd be drinking at four o'clock in the morning, yeah. sitting singing. Uh, you know, and then teaching the next day. Tara, it was just, it just rolled mm. until um, I got engaged to a guy called John. That didn't work out six weeks before my wedding. I uh, thought this isn't going to work out at all. And my mother actually said to me, well, Roberta, I'm not allowing you to walk up the aisle. <laughs> if if a week after you get married, you know, you're stuck with it, whatever. Yeah. Think about it, really. And so uh, we we did split at that stage. Mommy said, well, you see, my mother was a Christian at mm. this, you know. So she actually said to me, if Father God wants you to marry him, put it mm. off for a year, put it off for two years, you'll still marry John, mm. okay? John was my mother's favourite. My brother above me, had gone to Australia uh, on the £10 passage with his wife. So mommy was missing my brother Mm -hmm. and John came in as Henry, as my brother. And she loved John, whatever. And and she said, oh, you'll you'll, do, but just put it off at the moment. But I never went back. I never, that Mm -hmm. was the end of that. And that was another... You know, you begin to question, why am I on the earth? What's this all about, really? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know where I went to at that stage. I went somewhere. Yeah. I don't know. I was very messed up. Uh, living on my own, um, uh, no relationship, mm. uh, whatever. Just cut off. Very lonely. Uh, and your mum? Oh, she was She was away. She, she was at home. But I was at Jordanstown. Would, would she, did she know about your drinking? No. Did not, she, not not as much. Did no. she have a sense? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Stank of it. Oh, really? Stank, yeah, yeah. the breath stank. I mean, even the teachers in school um, oh, really? would have uh, said, Roberta, you know, um, y- you don't look too well. <laughs> yeah. I was hungover, uh, you know, and, and then took a drink to uh, uh, cure, counteract yeah. that yeah. and whatever. So by the time I got to 1975, um, I was not a well girl. Mm. I was putting on the act. You see, I've also got a personality that can cover. Oh, wow. Um, but it, it, m- most people do not know my innards, mm. okay? Most people don't get the Roberta Clements that's inside here. There's there's nearly like two people. And it's a, it's a lovely mask whenever you're you're confident and you're bubbly and you're energetic uh, because you can no, give people so much and not give them a thing. Yeah. Not one drop uh, off you. I and know. people might not necessarily know that. Uh-huh, I yeah. know. So I was that person that could cover, Mm -hmm. really. And then it got to a stage where uh, one of my boyfriends called Ali came home from America with his wife, with his new wife. And we were all standing at Port Muck, uh, uh, up at the cottages at Port Muck. And um, I think if I can remember back, I mean, it's a long way back, this, you know, 1975. (laughs) Remember, I think somebody had had their child christened or uh, at church. And we were all standing at the wall at Port Muck. And somebody brought out, you know, the wines and the booze and we all, well, a lot of us started to drink. But I'd got to that stage that I didn't stop. Mm. I, I, my, whatever, I couldn't top up. I I couldn't get to a level where I felt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, And nobody told me that drink is a depressant. Mm -hmm. I never, ever knew that drink could depress you. And that's why a lot of people who are drunk cry into their beers. You know, Mm -hmm. poor me, poor me. Well, uh, we all went to the golf club. And I used to play golf in those days. Did we, you? I did. Unbelievable. Yeah, no, I've done everything. Oh, you could have went pro. I, An- another sure. version of your life. I just <laughs> no. saw it flash before my eyes there. I even had a whole wall. <laughs> seven. I know, did all that as well. So we were round at the golf club and we were all supposed to eat. Well, if you know anything about people drinking, they forget to eat. Mm. And they might take a wee snack or they might take um, uh, flakes. What do you call them? Forgotten the word. Crisps. Yeah. They might have a bag yeah. of crisps with it, but that's not a full. So by the time it got, and I had my guitar going, we'd gone round to the golf club at about half four. By nine o'clock, we're all still sitting drinking. Yeah. And I'm drinking away, but I had my guitar going, sitting, sitting singing in the 60s. And into my head came, 
you know, there's not one person here sitting around this group would give two day about you, Roberta. You know, big thought. And into my head came wee words like, nobody loves you, nobody cares. What are you on the earth for? Whatever. So I ended up going down to Ferris's Bay, which is near Lauren Golf Club. And I went into the sea to try and commit suicide. Now, I was not a great swimmer. Mm-hmm. Um, and I went in, absolutely stosis, into the water with the clothes on, whatever. And a lady, this is where the story starts to change. A lady in the golf club called Pearl Callum. Pearl, who's now dead, she's gone. Pearl was watching the setup, sitting singing with everybody else and having a wee drink and whatever. But she saw something in me. Mm-hmm. I don't know. She saw something in me and she came down after me and pulled me up out of the water. And I stayed with her for a week. And she had a wee place along Ferris's Bay, along the wee lane, yeah. wee wooden shacky type uh, place. And she began to say to me, you know, Roberta, I think I think you're alcoholic. Mm. I what? Don't be stupid. Me alcoholic? Not at all. I'm having fun. I'm having now I knew I wasn't having fun. <laughs> and and see see that term, like because now we're very au fait with like all sorts of addictions and alcoholism mm-hmm. and no. trauma and AA groups and oh there's a wee twelve step here and there's a wee twelve step there. Like in those days at that time. That was very shameful really? for a female to be alcoholic. Especially a female. Well, well alcoholic, it, the word wasn't, it was, well, in the, uh, way back then you would probably call me a drunkard. Mm-hmm. Um, alcohol, alcoholic now is a very nice word. So it's softer, for it. isn't it? It yeah. is. It's a softer word. Yeah. But I was a drunkard. Mm-hmm. I, was, I was drunk. For the last two years of my drinking life, I don't remember very much about it, although I was functioning and I was a, fun- a functioning alcoholic. Wow. So, and that we in the golf club? That night, you're sitting playing the guitar. You talk about that wee voice saying those things. What do you... What do you think about that voice as? Is that your own voice? Is that drink? Is that... What is that? Well, I believe it was Satan. I believe there was a a, a devil. Uh, I do believe in Mm -hmm. a personal devil. Demonic. Um, And it was... Really, him trying to do my life in. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure whether he knew what was ahead of me. I don't think he did. But uh, he probably saw that I was a strong person. I've also, I'm, my personality is very much either or. Mm. I'm either in it or I'm out of it. I'm not, I'm very, you know, that's it. Yeah. So though nobody loves you, nobody cares is really a lie from the pit. Because they're like the reason why I asked was because they're very specific words. You know what I mean? It's not. It, it feels strange that like you would just be sitting there having a drink, and all of a sudden you would just think these wee things. You know what I mean? It's no, it was definitely what I call an attack. Well, looking back now, I wouldn't have known at okay, the time. Yeah, yeah. But uh, hindsight's uh, twenty twenty, uh, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I ended up uh, staying with Pearl, and Pearl's father, Bobby was alcoholic, but he went to Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't know him. So she told me his story. And then she said, I think you're alcoholic, Roberta. Now, I still want to drink while I was with her. Yeah. And she took a wee drink. Yeah. So I would sneak up to the golf club and ask some of the kids to buy me a bottle of vodka. I, mean, I was a VAT-19 drinker. Yeah. But, uh, and I would sneak, uh, started to get sneaky, mm. you know, and then she asked, would I accept this lady coming down to speak to me? Mm-hmm. And me being me, I love people. <laughs> hey, bring Send her on. <laughs> so this lady came in. She was called Elsie. And Elsie, I couldn't put two and two together because Elsie was a lady of about 42, 43, came in in a beautiful grey leather suit coiffured with her nails done, oh her makeup <laughs> on and, and whatever. And she started to tell me her story. And her story was that uh, her they'd bought her son, an 18-year-old son, a new car. Mm-hmm. And two weeks later, he died <sighs> with a car accident. And that went for her. Now, she was a person who took a wee drink. Um, and that went for her. And she got to the stage where she was hiding drink in the coal house and whatever. And I couldn't, I really could I'd never met a person who would admit that they were alcoholic. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I didn't, my parents didn't drink. 
my mother or father didn't drink. So I hadn't, I'd never met anybody like this before. And I'm put, trying to put this lovely lady into, because my attitude of an alcoholic was the skid row, the person who yeah, has yeah, no yeah. house to live in and, uh, you know, sleeping in sleeping bags out in the cold. And, you know, I, I'd, I had no idea. Mm-hmm. So at, at the end, then, uh, Pearl took me to my doctor's. Now, my doctor was very fond of me because I was the first first person that he birthed. Oh, really? It's called Percival, Har- per- Percival Harris. Percy. And, uh, yeah, I was the first baby that he brought into the world. And he said to my mother, what are you going to call this baby? And m- my mother thought she was going to have a boy. Mm-hmm. So she was calling me Robert James. And he looked at her and he says, well, I think, Molly, you're going to have to change this name to Roberta. <laughs> and so he named me. And always, in those days, the doctors came to your house. You know, if you phoned up, yeah. the doctor actually came out to see the child and whatever. You didn't have to run away to the surgery. So when he came to the house, mum even came a cup of tea. He was, he was a lovely, lovely, lovely man. And uh, so much so that when I eventually uh, did the Grand Opera House when I was singing, uh, he came to see me and whatever. Wow. Lovely man. Uh, I think he's dead now. I haven't seen him. Uh, he, he must be, I would think. So um, I ended up then being put into Perdisburn. He wouldn't put me into Shaftesbury Square because he thought that I would probably fight with the man who ran it. <laughs> and so I was put into, into Perdisburn. And that's like a what, Perdisburn, mental uh, it's, asylum? It's now like called a... Knock Bracken Clinic. Okay. Uh, it, yeah, mental hospital. And, and in those days, they didn't. Very different to today. Well, they didn't imagine. have any yeah. idea, I don't think, how to work with a person who had a drink problem or a drug problem or addiction or whatever. I was just put in with everybody, <laughs> <laughs> male side, female side. And it was while I was in there, um, I had a, a an L, it wasn't an LP, it was a, a tape, a tape. Yeah, you probably don't even know what it you know, Like a, a cassette tape? A cassette tape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a tape in my, to this day, I don't know where the tape came from. I haven't a clue. It wasn't mine. I didn't like Chris Christopherson singing. I do now, but I didn't in those days because he sort of growls along. And there were, t- on, it, the, the album's called Jesus is a Capricorn. And there were two songs on that. One was called Help Me, not Help Me Make It Through the Night, Help Me. And the other one is Why Me, Lord. And I began to listen to Help Me. And one of the, I began to, you see, it wasn't that I didn't believe that God wasn't there. I was I was brought up in a, in a in a family who believed that God was there. My grandmother was a blind grandmother and she was a Christian as well. And Granny, when we were round at Granny's house, she would hear her talking to someone. Who are you talking to, Granny? <laughs> oh, I'm just talking to Jesus. And you're going, oh, well, OK. We, we, we didn't poo it or anything. Yeah. And she would say, uh, go and get me my coat. I want to go down the old park road. I, 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 I feel that Aggie wants to see me. And we would get her coat and whatever. Now, blind and all as she was, without a walking stick, without a white stick, she would go down. She never wanted us to go with us or anything because we didn't really understand why she didn't want us to go. But she would go down the, the old park road and go across to a, 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 a a pancake shop, buy pancakes and then go to Aggie's and whatever. And as soon as Aggie opened the door, oh, Minnie, I knew you would come. Mm. And Minnie, my grandmother, would pray with Aggie. And so my grandmother had a ministry of literally just listening to the Lord. She used the Lord as her eyesight as well. You know, she would be, um, I hear in those days, the baker used to come up the street in a, with a wicker basket. He would park his van at the bottom and he would put all stuff in this wicker basket. And then he would walk up and do the wee doors and, yeah. and whatever. Granny had great hearing, probably because she was blind. So... Uh, there, there's Geordie coming with the, 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 the bread, whatever. Where's my purse? And you would hear a wee hand going round, you know, tap, tap. And thank you, Lord. So she always she always talked That's a dialogue, yeah. to somebody. Yeah. And we always believed it was Jesus. So I always knew that there was a Jesus. I always knew there was a God. And so when I was in Purdysburn, I began to cry out to this person that I didn't know personally. But God, if you really are there, then you got to sort me out. you got to do something. And in the help me, the, the last two lines of help me, Lord, show me your master plan. What's the purpose for my life? I'm tw- nearly 28. I have no babies. All my friends were married and had their children, whatever. And I really felt out here somewhere. Mm. What's it all about? What, what What's my life all about? 
and I said to whoever it was out there, <laughs> you, you better show up in my life. And I had more suicide trips in, in Purdysburn. And I must have shared with Maureen, the girl that I used to sing with, she came up to see me. And I must, I, I can't remember how it. Uh, she um, went and told the nurses, your woman here's uh, collect, collecting, her, collecting her tablets, is going to do another one, whatever. Yeah. And when I went up to the hatch to get my tablets, they wouldn't give me tablets, they only give me liquid. Mm. And I told them where to stuff their liquid. <laughs> Am I allowed to say those words? I told them where to go with, you know. And so I was in Purdy Spring for the last two weeks of my time in there without anything. And it was torture, torture. It wasn't like sleeping tablets. It wasn't like anything at all. And I tell you, it was some, it was some time... God, you got to get me out of here. I, as I say, I didn't know him personally at all, whatever, but I was talking to somebody, whoever it was at that stage. And I came out, I had to promise the Purdy Spurn authorities that I would go home to stay with my mother. Mm-hmm. Now, another thing was that when I came home, uh, I wouldn't go out of the house because I was ashamed of my background. I taught in Cliftonville Primary, which was just down the right. We lived yeah, on the main yeah, Cliftonville yeah. Road. Yeah. And I taught in Cliftonville Primary, the school that I'd gone to as a child. Uh, Andermud Baptist Church was closed and it became, uh, the, the wee schools, all the wee schools around became Cliftonville Primary. And I went back to teach there. So I couldn't come out of the house. And then the phone went and a girl that I taught with called Anne Wright, she uh, had just had her first baby and come up for your tea, Bert. So got into the car and went up for my tea and George, her husband, great Cullybacky accent <laughs> and we'd had her tea and whatever. And George says to me, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go to a, a, a wee meeting on Sunday. So uh, I thought, I why not at all? Because I was trained going, going to church and whatever. It's not a big deal going to yeah. a, wee, a wee meeting. No idea. Absolutely no idea that anything would happen. And it was Ballymena Town Hall. And we stood to sing the first hymn. And I love to sing. This is how I know that I know that I know that Father God knows me inside out. He knows He knows how to speak to me. I could listen to a preacher and it wouldn't mean a thing to me. But as soon as singing starts, mm. my heart starts to bubble up or, or whatever. Something in the music, something in the song. And we stood to sing the first hymn, third verse. Is there a heart that is broken, weary and sighing for rest? Come to the arms of the Saviour, pillow your head in his breast. Jesus is passing this way, is passing this way today. And for me, I came into the presence of Jesus Christ. Mm. I mean, of, of to, to know him, to come into a really, really holy presence was absolutely something. And I couldn't lift my head, and my head just bowed, and the guy George was beside me. And I, I couldn't, I just couldn't lift my head at all. And I could hear Bert, that's my nickname, Bert, will you not come? Mm. I love you. I care for you. I even died for you. Will you not come? And I yielded my life to him there and then. Now, I had to walk the aisle later on to be uh, counselled. But I'd already given my life to the Lord direct with yeah, him. in that moment. And yeah. coming up uh, in the car, wee mini, George handed me a Bible and he put the Bible over across to me and he says, read Corinthians. Now, I knew I'd, you know, I'd learnt as a child, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and I knew all that. Got to Corinthians and the verse said, you have become a new creature. All things have passed away. All things have become new. And he said, I want you to write that out. When you go home, you write that out and you stand on it. And I had a big piece of cardboard and I wrote that out and I stood on it. My wow. feet stood on it. And I said, OK, Lord, I am a new creature. All that past has gone. And I knew there was a verse that, that I'd been taught as a, as a child the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me from all sin. I knew that when I asked Jesus into my life, when he came into my life, I knew that it was his blood that was shed at Calvary. I knew that the blood had covered me and that every all my past was away and I headed up that way. I was also a GB girl and the, the GB motto is onwards and upwards. Mm. And so for me... I went 
onwards and upwards. I have never looked back. I've never gone back. It's not often that I go deeply into my testimony. I've, I've never looked back. I've gone forward all the time. And one thing, I did go to Alcoholics Not for about three days, but it, it just wasn't for me. But one of the things that they teach you in Alcoholics Anonymous is, is to take your life one day at a time. Mm-hmm. And that is scriptural in Matthew 6. It says, don't think about tomorrow. Just take your life one day at a time. So at the beginning, I took, well, I still do, take my life one day at a time and I walk forward all the time uh, and whatever. But that's not the end. I got to, I was still in show business. Mm -hmm. I was still singing in show business and no one was going to tell me that I was to give up my show business at all because Cliff Richard could do it. (laughs) So could I. (laughs) So I'm still singing in pubs, although I've given my life to the Lord. I'm still singing in pubs. And I was asked to sing at Le Mans uh, Hotel. And um, the lady there was called Mrs. Huddleston, who owned the hotel. And uh, she was Scottish. Well, I don't know whether she was Scottish, but the whole tale was like tartan uh, carpet and everything Scottish. And at the Christmas time, that was October, that was the 5th of October 1975 that I gave my life to the Lord. And th- this Christmas coming up, I was the singer and they, they brought acts across from Scotland. And one of the acts was the Alexander Brothers. You probably don't know who they <laughs> are. <laughs> no. They played a squeeze box and they sang all these old Scottish Camellias and songs and whatever. So they were the big act, and I was the person who went on stage first because I played a banjo and told jokes and everything and t- sang. My first song was Snowbird, uh, Anne Marie Snowbird. So um, sh- she had these functions at Christmas. She did two weeks and big trestle tables, and it was always Christmas dinner and drink galore and whatever, and then the cabaret. Okay, so I'm I'm singing at Le Mans. And I got up to sing Snowbird. Beneath the snowy mantle, cold and grey. Started to sing Snowbird. And I went into Cotton Jenny, my second song. And in the middle of my second song, I heard the Lord say to me, and this is where I know people think I'm a bit wired and weird and whatever, (laughs) but there's a scripture verse that says this, my sheep hear my voice. And I'm convinced that if you are his, you will hear him. And my ears are I always want to hear what he has for me. So in the middle of this song, I hear, I want you to tell these people that you've met me. Well, the sweat broke on me. Uh. <laughs> I could feel it running down You're my good stage fright, but you do now. <laughs> I could feel the sweat pour. It, it was just, oh, please. And I'm still singing mm. what I could hear. I want to, you know, and I've always wanted to obey what he has for me because he knows what's best. I made a mess. He knows what's best. So it, it ended up then that uh, I turned to the boys in the band and I said, KFC, you'll know this. It's only a three-chord trick. Uh, you'll you'll be able to follow me. And I started and to tell them that it just came out of Purdy's Burn and that I'd given my life to Jesus. And this was the song, Help Me, that had brought me through um, to ask for the master plan. And this was the master plan. God makes no mistakes that I'm singing here tonight in front of you. OK. And I went in to help me. And after about the second line of help me, there was absolute silence, mm. absolute. Nobody moved. The The barman didn't move. Uh, and I just knew that I was st- singing in the presence of Jesus and, and the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. He was there and he just he just clamped everybody. And at the end, I had a stand ovation. And that, that was the beginning of me knowing that my singing voice is a gift from God. I'd used it for my own monies, but I knew that he was beginning to say to me, I only want you to sing my songs. Mm. And so I I finished off and whatever, but they clapped for probably about seven minutes, really. And at the end of that, three people came across to me afterwards and said that they all, two were BB boys in their day and one was a GB girl and they knew that they weren't in the right place and uh, whatever. And I I just began to realise that this is the purpose for my life. My life is his Mm -hmm. and that he wants to flow through me. Why? I do not know, but there you go. So it ended up then that I just... um, uh, didn't know this is where you came in when when you arrived at my house uh, when I told you my story now it rolls through onto uh, the Easter time and I'm still singing in show business and I'm starting to do a few church things 
And at the Easter time, I was asked to sing at the CEF uh, conference at Portrush. And the exact same time, at Portrush Town Hall, Tom Raymond, who was in show business then, he's now dead, uh, he asked me to sing at Portrush Town Hall. I told you this story way back. And uh, I didn't know which date I was supposed to do. Am I supposed to do the Lord's date? Or am I supposed to do the show business date? The show business date was 40 quid, and it was way back, 40 quid for five songs. Good. And Good CEF dough, yeah. was uh, a, a cup, cup of tea and, tea and, and a Mars bar bun. bun. <laughs> and I'll get you back next year. And you're going. And I just got my wee house in Jordanstown and I'm looking at new curtains and everything. And the head was going. Sure, yeah. Forget about the CEF, you know, do the, you know. So it, the split started to come. And I phoned, and this was a big learning point for me. I, I phoned Eileen, my friend that I had uh, met, and lovely Christian girl, and I phoned her. And she'd been a Christian for about 13 years. Phoned her up. She was working up in Lisburn. And I said to her, Eileen, how do you really, really, really know what you're supposed to be doing? And she hit me with, Roberta, you're the one who's telling everybody you've met Jesus. Well, just ask him yourself. <laughs> And what a savage line, that I love it. Was, <laughs> that was just really something else. How, how do you, well, how do you get, you know, it's not going to say in the Bible. Uh, yeah, 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 you, do you, the you CEF can't, You can't thing. do CEF yeah. and you can do this or whatever. Don't tell you that. And she said to me, just get on your knees. Jesus knows what you're all about, what your heart's all about, what you want to do. He wants to guide you. Ask him. Just ask him. And that's what, for anybody listening, I would advise anybody who's listening, just ask. I asked God, if you're there, turn up. Mm. That's how it came in the first place. So this asking of Jesus, what is it you want me to do? And I opened up, I have a little book called My Daily Light. Uh, first of all, it was my Bible, it was Scripture Union Notes. And it said, you cannot serve two masters. And I'm going, is my singing of the devil and is it the, <laughs> you know, the other, the gospel singing of the Lord and whatever. Didn't really, didn't really get that one. Uh, and the next one was then in my daily light, uh, they sang as it were a new song. And my verse that I stand on is my promise from Father God is Psalm 40. Um, and he's lifted free from the Mary clay and set my feet upon a rock. Verse three, and he's put in my mouth a new song, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and put their trust in the Lord. That's my verse. Mm. I stand on that verse when I sing. That's what I quote before I go on uh, and whatever, because it's not my job to uh, bring them to the Lord. I, I'm like a tin opener. Um, some some preachers and pastors got me to sing just before they opened the word yeah. because singing to everybody, it doesn't matter who you are, music and singing opens the heart to receive the word. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's really um, how I ended up only singing gospel songs. Mm -hmm. I did the CEF, told Tom Raymond that uh, I couldn't do his date. And then phoned up the pubs that I was engaged in and said, look, I don't mind coming, mm -hmm. but I, I mean, I'll be singing my gospels. Oh, no, Roberta, no. <laughs> I says, well, I can sing light hard ones, you know, like one day at a time <laughs> and, and whatever. He says, no, no, I think we'll just leave it. I think. So for a while I was just, you know, paddling about, uh, really. And then it, um, it, it's a, a fear started to come into my head uh, where because I wasn't focused on singing, this fear started to come in. And um, I was in my house in Jordanstown and he started to have... Now, by this stage, I'm a Christian and I'm believing that, that his way is best. So I'm in my bedroom at in my wee house in Jordanstown and I started to have dark experiences coming back at me. Um, and words starting to come into my ears again and whatever, and I didn't really know w what was happening. So I went to my doctor, and my doctor looked at me and says, Roberta, I think you need to go back into Purdysburn. So I was back in Purdysburn by June 1976, and um, by this stage now, a lot of people were praying for me. Mm. A lot of churches knew that I'd had to go back into Purdysburn. Some people falsely said that I'd gone back to drink yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and whatever. And uh, I don't, it, it was just a very dark passage to go through. Um, so I'm lying in Purdysburn and this wee man arrived. 
and uh, we grew a beard, age group began about 45, and he said, hello, I'm Billy Landrum. I hadn't a clue who he was <laughs> at all. He says, uh, do you mind coming and speaking to me? And I says, no, not at all, but it's my tea time. Uh, and I love my food. You would know by the size of me, I love my food. <laughs> so uh, he says, well, I haven't much time. I says, well, OK, I'll, I'll buy ball. My, and I went out. Now, when I think back to me going out with a strange man out to a car outside uh, the, the wee place in Rathlow, yeah. but I went out sitting in the car with him. And one of the things that really spoke to he was the uh, minister, vicar, whatever you want to call it, Church of Ireland man, uh, St Mary Magdalene's, I think, down Donegal Pass. Mm-hmm. And uh, he said, uh, someone has phoned me up. He didn't tell me who it was. I haven't a clue who phoned him. And he, he listened to me. And uh, that that was very key because some people, when I was talking about seeing dark things and like a cat coming up, the, the you know, it was, it was really a very frightening experience. And he never said anything at all. And he just said... Uh, I believe you are a Christian now. And I said, yes. And he said, well, would you mind if I prayed with you? And I said, no, not at all. And he prayed what I call a deliverance prayer. Okay. okay. He, lay, he didn't lay hands on me. His hand was about here somewhere. And he prayed along the lines of, um, Father God, this is your blood-bought child. And I'm asking you in Jesus' name to remove anything that's not of you. I'm asking you to deliver her from what it is that's attacking her. And I had it like a flu. I had something come up right up through my head and off, okay? And I was supposed to be in Purdysburn for about four weeks. I was in for five days. The the shrink wouldn't let me out. And I kept saying, look, (laughs) I know I've been delivered. I know I've been delivered. And they were putting down, you know, she's hyper. (laughs) Do you know that (laughs) in Purdysburn they don't have Bibles? They don't have any Gideon Testaments or Bibles in Purdue, but they won't allow them in. And it's because they think some people have gone highwire. Um, so I got out and I have never looked back from that. I believe that I was delivered from the spirit of alcohol. Mm. Now, there are people who question all of that. I just know that I know that I know mm-hmm. that I was different, that I never went back, never, ever thought of alcohol and have been involved in, I mean, I would go down to the golf club and in Isle McGee and have an orange or whatever. It doesn't fuss me at all. I have been delivered in Jesus' name from the spirit of alcohol. And and a lot of people need that, but we don't hear that preaching any longer. So I've just motored on. I could talk here all day. I have stories galore. Um one particular story that I'll tell you. I was singing for two weeks in the Shankill Mission with Eric Lennon. And uh, on the Friday night, this uh, Shankill Mission has a, uh, uh, the, their hall is upstairs. Mm-hmm. OK. And the doors are like bar doors, you know, those doors that swing. You know, the way uh, like we, the, cow, we cow the cowboy, cowboy doors. doors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> so um, Eric Lennon has just, uh, I, I'd already sung. I'd already done three songs, I think, I'd already sung. And the mission for two weeks, this was the first Friday night. So as I'm, uh, I'd sat down, the doors swung open and in came this awful <laughs> drunk, uh, well-known from the Shankill. I didn't know him at all. So he comes up the front, Eric Lennon's, uh, and it, the, the drunk actually dangled in front. You know, I don't know whether you know anything about some of the drunk, they dangle like as if they're on strings. Yeah. And he's dangling when you know, you've got me, you've got me, you've got me. And Eric Lennon looked across at me and said, Bert, would you look after him? Yeah. And in my head, I'm going, thank you very much. <laughs> you know, but anyway, he sat beside me. And uh, having been a good school teacher that could uh, grab <laughs> without <laughs> marking. <laughs> I grabbed his shoulder. I'm serious. <laughs> I grabbed his shoulder and I said, I'll tell you something, sunshine. You sit quiet. You see, if you don't sit quiet, <laughs> you know. And he looked at me. I think his head was going, glad I'm not married to her. <laughs> so he sat beside me and he was stinking. He must have rolled up, up the shankle. There must have been horses, horses, doofers, as I call He was stinking, absolutely stinking. And I don't have a great sense of smell, but I could still, you know. And at the end, Eric Lennon preached a very uh, uh, great gospel, the lost sheep, okay? So he he preached the lost sheep and uh, the shepherd. Very simple. And your man, he gets up, this fella gets up in age group, about 60, 65, real old person on the road. 
And Eric Lennon said to me, Roberta, would you look after him, please? So I had to take him out and uh, he was in, we were in a wee room and he looked at me and he says, you have lovely brain eh? Oh, yeah. And I'm going, let me tell you something, Sunshine. <laughs> you're not here to do business with me. You're here to business with Father God. If you're, if you're not, you're out the door. Do you understand? Oh, he says, I want to do business with Father God. So um, I led him to the Lord uh, in a simple prayer and got his hand. And I got his hand like this and I went, right, your promise is I well, nearly pulled the fingers off. I will never leave you. Say it. <laughs> and he said, I will never leave you. He did it about five or six times and whatever. And then I had uh, took him out to Eric and Eric dealt with him and whatever. And um, I went home I and mean, I didn't pray with anybody else and, and whatever. went home. And on the Saturday night, uh, came back to the Shankill. It was a two weeks mission. I was a singer every night. And uh, this guy standing in the hall. And he's got a suit on and his hair shaved like yours. <laughs> it's lovely. And, Processed. <laughs> and uh, he looks at me and he goes, I will now. And I couldn't believe that this was the same man from the night before. Wow. And Eric had taken him home to his house and got him a suit and a tie and whatever and got his hair cut and gave him a bath and, and whatever. And John made it. You know, he he turned a corner. He became the new creature. Eric gave him a wee job. In those days, the Shankill Mission had two houses that looked after people, uh, you know, that had uh, addiction problems. And Kay and myself, I have a prayer partner called Kay, and Kay and myself, we were looking for a gate leg table for Kay's daughter, Nikki, who had gone across to Scotland to do her education or whatever. And she, she was in a flat over there. So we went up the Shankill to look for... Um, this gate leg table in a charity shop. And we're just about to go into the charity shop. This is about three years later when I heard, Bert, Bert. <laughs> and I looked across and there's John. Wow. And he's still going, I will never oh, come leave on. you. <laughs> Seriously. But I, mean, I have stories galore. I did prison work. Um, I was the singer for quite a quite a time and I did the singing for the first symposium. Is this, I have something in my head, right? And me and Nathan talk about this and we're like, is that true? There's no way that's true. Is it true that at some point, I don't know when or where or how, I don't even know if it's legal to say this, that like when some prison somewhere, whenever people were suicidal, they'd call you before they would call anyone else? That's mm -hmm. crazy. That was Macabre. It's one great story. Um, I arrived into Macabre. I, I had a pass. <laughs> well, how I got into, I'll say how I got into prison yeah, work, yeah. first of all. I had no notion of doing prison work at all. I was the singer Loved admissions, loved out singing, loved meeting people, loved leading people to the Lord, blah, blah, blah. And I uh, sang for a guy called James McElroy, who has since gone to be with the Lord. But James uh, had lost his job in Old Bleach in Randallstown. And a guy called Bill Fitch had been across in America and had met Chuck Colson, who was the sidekick of Watergate scandal. And he had done prison. Chuck Colson's done prison. Oh, wow. And then I think before he went into prison, he became a Christian. And then when he was in prison, he saw this vision of starting prison fellowship. So Bill Fitch came across back from America, went to James McElroy, who'd lost his job, was made redundant and said, great job for you. And to cut the long story short, James McElroy became the head of the beginnings of prison fellowship. But I sang alongside him quite often at different things. And so I was the singer at the symposium in 1983 in Queen's Elms, sang every night at the different things. And on the Thursday night, Chuck Colson got up and he said, um, I want you to visualise the wee prison doors. Uh, prison fellowship at Easter time were allowed to go on to the uh, cells. And this particular boy was going to be uh, hung. I don't know why he's hung or, uh, or uh, injected, but he was going to be put to death. But he had become a Christian before uh, he, they still couldn't stop it. Sure. And so Chuck felt that he and the uh, singing team would go across and sing outside his cell. So they were singing outside his cell and uh, the prisoner said to Chuck, come here a wee minute. And we had to, Chuck made us visualise the wee prison door. And he said, I want you to visualise this. And I put my ear to the wee window. And the prisoner said, I knew you would come. 
and Chuck Colson through a sort of a lazy pointing, you know. And here in Northern Ireland, there are people in our prisons, in your prisons here, that would not be in prison except for the troubles. They mm. they wouldn't be the the decent criminals, as they call them. Uh, they're only there because of, of what they've done within the, the, the troubles and whatever. And they are waiting for you to come. And as he said that, I, ha- I had like an arrow go through my chest, like, poof, and I'm going, absolutely no <laughs> way. I'd kill them. <laughs> if they've done their dirty deed, I know what I would do with them. Yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah. no way. I had no interest whatsoever. Okay, singing. But I had no no idea. And then I had, when I started, James McElroy came to me and he says, I want you to start the female work. And I thought, James, it's not for me. It's not for me. And he says, start reading your Bible and start asking, are you supposed to be doing it and whatever. And as I started reading different passages and whatever, not really searching, just reading my normal stuff, whatever, I had a, a, not a vision but an awareness. My father was a very cruel father. And uh, he didn't want the babies, as I called them, next Molly. I was very close to my mother and very protective of her. And uh, this particular, this thing that came into my head at this stage was there was one time he he was very heavy with a strap, uh, which I still have. It was a shaving, the old fashioned shaving strap, leather strap. And that's what he would beat me with. So uh, when I was about 15, I remember him taking it into, taking me into the kitchen. Uh, and in those days, I mean, our kitchens were very small. They were sculleries, as they called them. Uh, and I was beaten very heavily. And I would never cry at all. And the Lord brought me back to one of those times when I was being beaten. And the Lord said to me, you know, Roberta, it's only by my grace that you didn't lift a knife and kill your father. And it was on the back of that that I understood that some people that mm. were in prison were there uh because they did do deeds, and um, so when it came, why do you keep the strap? Why did I keep the strap? My father, when I got my cottage to Nile McGee in two thousand and four, my father gave it to me as a present. It's <laughs> never black and white, is it? <laughs> so it's sitting in my kitchen, and uh, no, it doesn't remind me of anything. In fact, uh, I ended up at the very end of my father's life, leading him to the Lord. Wow! I had to forgive him. I had to get through. That's another. I could be here all day. <laughs> uh, I, I had to go through a, a passage of forgiveness for my wow. father and uh, led him to the Lord about three days before he died. Wow. And he changed. I mean, he, cha- he he changed so much that he didn't curse any longer. That's crazy. And then he told me that he loved me and all sorts of things. Too long a story. Um, so where are we now? Uh, we're, well, uh, you were ta- finish, in, finish the prison story and then we'll uh, start to, we'll, we'll wrap up. Wrap up, yeah. yeah. So going into prison, I was I was phoned to come and see this guy in McGabry and he had uh, tried to commit suicide and so he was in the hospital wing. Now, I was very privileged and so was Kay Jordan, the other girl. There was four of us, but two of us got passes to go down the cells at any time of the day or night, OK? We could go anywhere, male or female side. You just can't imagine that. Well, we did. And some uh, have to say that some of the pastors couldn't understand because I am not qualified. I, <laughs> I didn't go to... Um, I'm qualified by Father God, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I'm not... I didn't go to uh, any place to learn anything at all. It's just by following what he has for me. So anyway, I got this phone call, this guy, and I arrived in and went to the hospital wing in McGabry and the guy on the hospital wing wouldn't let me in because I was female going into a male side. Now, I I understood that. Um, But I'm questioning in my head, Father God, why did you bring me through all the gates? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I'm, I'm not allowed in. And um, it ended up then that just at that time, this is where I go, my divine appointments, <laughs> just at the time when I was at the gate, a guy crossed that I knew. And I said to him, what are you doing here? And he says, I've given up teaching. He taught and he gave up teaching to become a prison officer. Wow. So I said, what well, could you tell this guy here who yeah, I yeah, am, yeah. what I am, prison fellowship and whatever. Yeah. And uh, the, the guy said, that's OK, but... Would you stay with Roberta? So the prison, I'll not say who he is, the prison officer stayed with me. My friend stayed with me. And uh, I wasn't allowed into the hospital part of it. But they gave me a wee room that was like uh, for the brushes and the toilet (laughs) rolls and and whatever. So I was put into this wee room. 
and the guy was brought in to me. I'll not tell you his name either. And the guy was brought in to me and I looked across and lo and behold, in this store was a guitar. Unbelievable. And I play a guitar and I said to him, who owns this? And he says, I don't know. And he says, would you mind if I sang a song to you? And he says, no, but he couldn't do anything <laughs> else. He was stuck. So I sang, I sang Help Me and told me told a bit of my story. And uh, he just sat and wept. And I said to him, have you any background of um, church, God, or whatever? And he had. And I said, well, would you like to come back to the Lord? And he did. Mm. And he came back to the Lord. Now, he had to stay in the hospital wing for a wee time. And uh, he, he had to stay in prison for a time. But I, I passed him on to a male, a male that worked with prison fellowship. And he looked after him. And the guy got out and has, as far as I know, has walked with the Lord ever since. So I love divine appointments. I love... Um, Just like your granny Pearl. Yes. I mean, Pearl, Pearl was... Uh, it's sort of strange that she would know that I wasn't feeling too well, you know, in mm. in, in uh, the golf club. But I mean, I have story stories galore. Really, yeah. there's another one that I went to school with, Clark. Um, he or oh, not your granny Pearl? Sorry, who's your blind granny called? M- Minnie. Minnie. She was Minnie. Yeah, there's uh, when you were t- talking about no, her. Pearl. Pearl, Pearl was, was the golf club woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But your you know your blind granny Minnie. Yeah. It's funny that she she had that as well. Just a wee inkling or a wee feeling. Oh, go talk to that person. You well, very again, much. I go back to the verse, my sheep know my voice. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would question, I, I, I know, I question people who haven't heard Jesus talking to them. I, I don't understand it. I yeah. just don't understand it at all if they haven't had a wee word or whatever. Now, my mother was not the evangelist as I am. Mm-hmm. My mother had four children. And my mother's job was to make sure her children was brought up as she was Presbyterian and I was brought up Presbyterian. And when they uh, take on their vows, they bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And she she did that faithfully. She, mm. she, she made sure. Anyone who's listening, uh, I just want to say that uh, at the background of everybody, and I mean everybody, there is someone praying. Someone, my granny prayed, my mother prayed. But there's a song that I sing that says that the Lord Jesus is praying for us. He's forever interceding. He's talking to the Father on our behalf. And it doesn't matter whether you're his or not his as yet. He is still praying for you. Because one of the verses that's coming into my head now is that why he came, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell, I was going to tell you about Clara, but I'll tell you maybe finishing this last story. Kay and myself, we, we both come from Lisburn. And we do a lot of shopping together. <laughs> I'm not the shopper. She is. <laughs> and we go shopping and she's the one who goes in and, and spends hours putting on and off clothes and whatever and then comes out and doesn't buy anything. I would be a specific shopper. I need a pair of shoes to go buy yeah, a and pair of shoes five and get it. Yeah. That's me. But anyway, we were coming up the, in the old days, coming up the back of, uh, there was a car park at uh, Dunn's store in Lisburn. This is pre to the new building. And we are coming up the, the corridor to Dunn's and there's two wee lads standing outside Dunn's. Okay. And I was a teacher and so was Kay. I was a P4 teacher. So, Two wee fellas standing there, and one wee fella, he's gurning his guts out, absolutely gurning. And the other wee fella was about three, and he's standing with a bolly lollipop in his mouth, having a happy time. So I went across, both of us went across to this wee fella who's crying, and I says, what's wrong, son? I've lost my mommy, I've lost my mommy, I've lost my... I said, you'll be all right, you'll be all right. We'll go and get your mommy, we'll go, is she, is she in done? I don't know, I don't know. I said, well, we'll, we'll put it over the thing, we'll get your mommy. And I said, look, look, is this your wee brother? Huh? Well, look at your wee brother, your wee brother's not crying. And he turns and says, I... But he doesn't even know he's lost. Yeah. So so we find the mother and I'm walking up uh, towards the main street of Lisburn and I heard the Lord say very clearly to me, You know, Roberta, this is just how it is. Many people don't even know they're lost. Mm. And that's where a lot of people are. A lot of people that I work with now in Island McGee haven't a clue about uh, being lost and found or the shepherd and the sheep or any anything at all. And it, uh, I feel that I'm alongside many people um, 
anywhere, it doesn't matter to me, whether it's in Tesco's or whatever, I, I look on the fields, I look across and I, the Lord says to me, have a deco. You know, a lot of these people, if I send my son back and when I send my son back and he's the only one, Father God's the only one that knows when Jesus is coming back and I believe he is coming back. You only have to look at the world. You only have to look at what's happening now just to, to know that something's happening outside of our control, really. And Father God's going to send Jesus back, but only those that are his will go to be with him. And uh, that's my job. But my job is really my singing, really. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm totally amazed at... My mother was... My mother's gone to be with the Lord now, but uh, I don't know what year this was, 2007 or something like that. Um, Mummy, it, it took a bad bile and uh, poisoned and we got the word that she was going to die and she ended up in uh, the Ulster Hospital and uh, very, very, very ill. We prayed with her, my sister Pauling and myself prayed with her and said, Mommy, I think it's time to go and she said, that's fine. She was very pained but uh, my brother Todd uh, came up the next day and made the consultants give her uh, an operation. I personally would have let my mother go, but Todd decided that uh, he wanted an operation. So they gave her an operation and uh, she came through the operation, which was a total miracle in itself. And everybody said it. The doctors all said, gosh, she must be a very strong lady. So uh, she was in intensive care for about four weeks and it was awful to watch. Divine appointment. The lady who, the girl who looked after the Ulster I had taught in Cliftonville Primary. <laughs> okay, she was called Judith. And when we came into the uh, ICU, Judith allowed Pauling and myself to stay a wee bit longer uh, to sit with Mommy and just to talk to her. My Mommy was out of it, totally out of it, with all these things up around her and, and whatever. And I have to say they were very good to her. Mm-hmm. One girl actually washed my mother's hair wow. when she was, you know, didn't know anything to make her look. Uh, th- they were wonderful, mm-hmm. absolutely wonderful. But anyway, we would sing, Pauling and myself would sing over Mommy. And we were singing, um, I am the Lord that healeth thee. I don't know where you know, you probably know the chorus, yeah? So uh, we were singing that chorus, I am the Lord that healeth thee. And that was okay. Judas would come across and say, just keep singing quietly it, with you singing. There was about 11 beds in the ICU at that stage. With you singing quietly over here, there's a lovely presence, there's a lovely peace. Wow. So we would sing and, and that, that was okay. We, I, Mommy came through all that and ended up in a care home or whatever. But Kay and myself rolled back, rolled forward about three or four months or something like that. And we're, Kay and myself were crossing Mark, uh, into Marks and Sparks at Lisburn. And uh, this woman came across to me and she said, hello, are you Roberta Clements? And I said, yes, I am. She said, I want you to speak to my husband. And I thought, what's this all <laughs> So we go across to, yourself. And I, we go across to this man and he said, I just want to say that I was sleeping in a bed uh, in a coma facing your mother in ICU Whoa. and I was not supposed to live. He was a farmer and had farmer's lung and there were, he was given days to live. And he heard <sighs> in a coma... He heard, I am the Lord that healeth thee, across the room. And he collected that. And now he was a Christian. He collected that in his spirit. And he got out. Crazy. Mad. But it was very nice of Father God to let me know the answer to that. Because that encourages me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, the, the, the divine appointments encourage me. I love, I love, you know, hearing afterwards. Yeah. Something has happened yeah. or, or whatever. And I just want to say as well that um, a missionary friend of mine called Lynn, and you know her too, uh, she has said to me, why have you not got your stuff on YouTube? <laughs> and I'm going, oh, I don't know. Nearly too old for it all. She says, don't be stupid, don't be stupid. Give me your CD. In fact, her husband had a, a CD with about six albums on it. And she said, give me it and I'll do it. So I just want to tell your listeners Absolutely. that for free, you can have my uh, all my albums uh, on YouTube. The full you just, dis- discography. You just, go, you just go Roberta Clements and push, Absolutely. push the button. And you yeah, and wherever you're listening listen or watching, we'd be delighted to do this part. We'll uh, put a link to it. So if you're listening on Spotify or Apple or whatever, or if you're watching on YouTube, just a link in the description and it'll take you straight there um thank you Not a Andy Burt I could be here I, all day we could be here all day we could <laughs> really be and because really and like it's it's funny because you know 
What are we? I we're coming up to eighty minutes in, and you're like, Aye. you know, I, I, there's so many stories we didn't even cover. Like you're flying off to New Zealand and working with big Maori guys in prison and all this, <laughs> all this mad stuff. But I think, I think the encouraging thing for me is to see, you know, even like the full circle nature of your story. Like here you are, your mum is worried to bits because she thinks she's got this malformed child in her. Can I tell you the end of that story? Tell me. Probably about five or six years ago, I took a very bad back, and I mean a bad back, I couldn't walk. And there's a girl in, and again, another divine appointment, because I'd met Ruth a long time back in Lisburn when I just got saved. Ruth had now moved to Whitehead, married a man down there, and she goes to Whitehead Baptist. So uh, I phoned Ruth, and I said, Ruth, I have a very bad back. She's a, a physio with special needs people. And so Ruth came down to my cottage in Island McGee and uh, did my back and whatever. But it, it, it didn't help really very much. And Kay, my friend Kay, brought me up to her house, left my car in Island McGee, brought me to her house, stayed with Kay for about four or five days, and I really couldn't move. And she says, right, you're going to hospital. <laughs> so I ended up going to hospital, uh, Langan Valley, into the Langan Valley, and uh, it ended up, it was a very, very, very bad urinary tract infection. So uh, I phoned back to Ruth and I said to Ruth, uh, when you were doing the rubby dubby stuff and whatever type of thing, it wasn't muscle at all, it was a urinary tract infection. And she said to me, Bert, have you ever been spina bifida? And I went, what? She said, have you ever been spina bifida? I said, well, not at all. What are you talking about? <laughs> she says, well, I work with special needs people. And when I was rubbing your back, I have a very, I shouldn't be telling this, but I have a very hairy back. <laughs> I love it. I Come on. <laughs> I'm very hairy back. Um, Ross goes crying into the microphone <laughs> over there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so as she was rubbing my back, she said, oh, it's some idea that you could have been spina bifida. And I'm going, wow. Crazy. Did I have spina bifida when I was in my mother's womb? Yeah. And did Father God heal me when she gave me to the Lord? I don't know, but it's a nice story. You know what? And it's a beautiful way to end. Roberta, thank you so much. Really Not appreciate it. Yeah. Not a problem. I'll be back. You probably will. <laughs> she said with a vengeance. We should split it up into like eras. It's like, no, we're, this episode, we're going to yeah. talk about New Zealand. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. All right.